Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fourth annual Steiner Symposium. On behalf of the Charlie Steiner School of Sports Communication, uh, I welcome you to the panel titled Rules of Sport, Regulation and Ethics. My name is Dunja Antunovic. I'm a faculty member here at the Steiner School, and I will be moderating this morning's panel. Um, it gives me great pleasure to see uh, current students, high school students, prospective students, alumni, community members, friends of the program, colleagues from other universities, um, and guests here today. Um, it's uh, wonderful to, to have you all here uh, join us for uh, this uh, fantastic event. Uh, allow me to recognize and thank Bradley alumnus, Mr. Paul Herzog and Mass Mutual for uh, generously supporting the symposium for the second year in a row. Uh, support like his enables us to bring nationally acclaimed speakers, such as the guests on today's panel, and to thereby enhance the quality of the conversation we deliver to our students. So thank you so much. I would also like to... I would also like to thank the Greg and Dan Show at 1470 WMBD for bringing news about the symposium to the wider Peoria community. At Bradley, we are a community committed to understanding and resolving problems around us. We understand that our differences are our strengths, that thinking critically, ethically, and creatively from a variety of perspectives enriches students' personal and professional growth. Our Steinel School of Sports Communication integrates the academic study of the field of sports communication um, with professional education, and today's panel is no exception. In fact, our panelists engage in research, professional practice, and education in their everyday lives. The four of them are exemplars of the multidimensional character of the sport industry. Their work illustrates the essential role communication plays in ensuring integrity, social inclusion, and ethical standards in sport. And it's such a great honor for me to welcome them here. To represent both the sport media industry and the scholarly perspectives, I would like to welcome two of my academic colleagues, Dr. Steve Bianeme and Dr. Ryan Rogers. Dr. Bianeme is assistant professor at Northern Kentucky University, where he teaches classes in journalism. Previously, he worked at several newspapers um, and concluded his career in journalism as the deputy NFL editor at foxsports.com. His current research on rules in uh, uh, light of this panel focuses on the gender and race related uh, representations as well as language in the Associated Press style book, which is that big book that your journalism professors make you carry. So, um, you know, he's, he's an expert on that. Dr. Ryan Rogers is assistant professor at Butler University. He also spent several years in the media industry, uh, working for Fox Sports, ESPN, and NFL Network. Um, I think that Dr. Rogers and Dr. Bianime will have a lot to talk about. <laughs> um, Dr. Rogers' current research focuses on esports, which is a topic that you heard about earlier today. And, and again, this um, uh, illustrates uh, to you, I think, that we'd like to ask questions and approach issues from multiple perspectives. So, to th so uh, this panel is going to probably bring a little bit of a different perspective on esports. Dr. Rogers also worked on Harry Potter films, and uh, we will not ask him about that because we could be here all day, and there are really other panels today, so um, you can talk to him after, um, after the panel about Harry Potter, and I'll try to not ask him about his favorite films and books. Um, at the center of monitoring and enforcing rules are sport officials. It is my pleasure to say that for the first time at the Steiner Symposium panel, we are including perspectives of officials in our conversation. I have the privilege to welcome Mr. Bill Corollo, coordinator of football officials for the Collegiate Officiating Consortium, overseeing the Big Ten, Mid-American, Missouri Valley football conferences, among others. Um, he worked for 20 seasons, uh, seasons as an NFL official, and he refereed two Super Bowls. Uh, Mr. Corolla also, uh, also worked for IBM for 30 years, and he will lend his expertise today on rules of football and their connections to technology and referee communication, among others. And finally, I am thrilled to welcome our outstanding alumna, Lauren Nimiera, who um, is Skyping in from um, O'Hare Airport, I believe. Um, <laughs> you might have noticed there's a little bit of snow outside, so um, I'm just grateful for our, our um, colleagues here at Bradley that we were able to connect with Lauren and that Lauren landed and uh, is able to join us via Skype, so we're really um, happy that you're able to join our conversation. Um, 
Uh, Nimiera was a basketball student athlete. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in sports communication and Spanish, and an MBA in leadership and human service administration. She worked as the Chicago Sky's media um, and communications manager, where her social media campaigns were recognized um, in the industry and featured actually also in Sports Illustrated. So um, she's uh, ran some very successful social media campaigns. Um, currently, she's an NBA G League official and an NCAA certified referee who works basketball games on professional and intercollegiate levels. And I believe she was working even last night at a game, right? So um, she has a busy, busy schedule. Um, she will be our expert on rules of basketball and their connections to public relations and fan experience, as these are also areas that she is going to be able to talk about. So welcome you all uh, to today's panel. Um, let's just start with, with um, kind of a simple question of what are your responsibilities at your current job and uh, for, uh, for the um, academics here, what are some things that you are thinking about in your research uh, in these days? So uh, we can start with uh, Mr. Corolla first. Well, my responsibilities uh, have to do with primarily football, and I oversee a, coll a collegiate a consortium of uh, collegiate conferences that um, that play football. And my job is to identify, and train, and hire, um, and continue to train and evaluate officials for football games. And it seems pretty simple. It's you know we're a minor celebrity on the field. We're not the player anymore. We're not the coach. Um, you know, we're not the sportscaster that televises the game, uh, but we are. We hold the integrity of the game. We, we're the keepers of the integrity of the game, and I think it's really important. Um, you know, I didn't grow up to, to be say that I wanted to be a referee. You know, most of us grew up that we wanted to be an athlete and wanted to continue to keep playing, but we just couldn't. It didn't have the ability, the skills, and so on. And I had some other interests, um, and I eventually. Um, through some mentors and through some coaches, they got me started in officiating. Um, but my responsibilities now at the collegiate level is to develop uh, officials for the college game, uh, as well as provide officials for the NFL. So it's a training program for the NFL, but at the same time, my highest prior priority is to hire officials to work the collegiate games and the conferences that you mentioned. Um, Lauren, would you like to chime in? I will. This opportunity to chime in on not an announcement going on in the airport. I've been muting and unmuting my line so that you guys won't hear those. Um, but basically, my, my daily responsibility is I'm a basketball referee, so um, I spend a lot of my time uh, organizing my schedule. You have to block out dates with certain assigners, so I go back and forth between NCAA women's basketball and uh, the G League. So uh, managing my availability is a, a large part of what I do. Um, rules study, uh, exercise to stay in shape, and then, you know, travel is what I'm doing today. I had a game last night in Canton, Ohio um, for the G League, and, you know, you spend a lot of your time trying to get from place to place, and then the on-court part is, is the fun part, I, I say, and uh, my job is to enforce the rules on the court, and, you know, we consider the rule book to be a legal document, so we are upheld to the highest standard um, when it comes to enforcing the rules on the court. Thank you. Dr. Um, I, I guess like my contribution here, like as an academic is, we teach rules as well. We work to enforce, in my discipline, journalism, journalistic rules. And as uh, Mr. Steiner said earlier, truthfulness and fairness is paramount in communication, just as in refereeing. And so, you know, so I, try to take a look at uh, how I would fit in on this panel, it is how are sports communicators talking about how rules are applied, how they're made, and things like that, because it's not an easy deal what y'all have to do. And I think at times it's a, a lot with a lack of understanding what goes into making rules, the structures, and things of that nature. So in that part, this is where my research goes, is looking at the structures of different things. So when we look at sports communication, who are making the rules, what are the ideologies or mentalities behind the rules and the motivations for different decisions? And so um, 
I think it's one thing to perhaps take away, at least early on, is it's easy to criticize or to look at the fallout of a decision, but to put yourself into the position of those making the decisions, because these things are, it's easy to look back and say, oh, this is wrong, or I would have done this. But like, how did everything lead up to a decision being made or a rule being created? Dr. Rob. So uh, my work primarily focuses on how video games impact players. Good, bad, and ugly, right? Um, there's been some talk of that already. That, married with my professional experience in sports media, uh, has really led me to looking at esports. And right now, and I think where I fit in on this panel, it's kind of the Wild West out there. I was speaking with, uh, with your dean uh, last night, and that was a term I'm borrowing uh, from him. But uh, it really is sort of lawless right now. And that's something where rules are going to end up being very important in terms of how, they're being, how the games are being regulated, how players are being regulated. Uh, but within that, um, when I look at my research kind of from a, from a zoomed out perspective, what are rules in a video game, right? It's what you can and can't do. It's what is coded into the game. And those rules have a very profound impact on the people who are playing them. And so that's uh, kind of feel where, I, where I feel I can uh, make a meaningful contribution to this conversation. And in this panel, we will um, go into much more detail about each of these topics. But uh, let's start with some rules in uh, basketball and football. And so to hear from, from, uh, from our officials, what are some major forces um, that uh, prompted rule changes? What are some major changes you have seen in the rules um, in uh, these two sports? And um, you know, what are the rationales behind uh, these rules? Lauren? I can, I can jump in on this. Um, you know, just as far as recent changes that were made to the NBA rules or even just mechanics or a way of doing things, um, right now are really related to all of you and your attention span um, when it comes to attending a game. So a lot of the things that were done recently were uh, around pace of play. So how can we get the ball quicker to a free throw shooter? How can we eliminate... Um, stoppage time for replays, how can we speed those things up? Uh, can we shorten half time and still have enough space to get um, the appropriate advertisements in? Uh, you know, so recent changes happened regarding that. Um, and then as far as rules on the court, you know, I think somebody was mentioning it earlier, as far as when you look at a rule, can it actually be enforced and what do we want called? So. There's a competition committee meeting annually that votes on rule changes, and uh, they vote on um, a slate of uh, plays that come through, and they look at them as far as you know some of the travels that you guys might complain about on Twitter, or on you know on TV, and all that's a travel. But do we really want that called right there, or what is that really going to take away from the game? So just as far as like you know, we work a lot on calibrating what we're going to consider, what we're going to deem to be a travel and not a travel within the rule. Um, so I think those are two changes for us. And then just, just as far as, you know, there was some testing last year in the G League as far as four-person refereeing crews as opposed to three um, and whether it would be efficient to have a fourth referee on the floor. Um, they're still going, you know, forward with testing regarding that. And it really just looks like the best place for the, the fourth official would either be additional staff in the replay center or somehow um, finding a way to put put an extra official at the table the same way they do for playoff games. Uh, as far as football is concerned, there are a lot of uh, changes that are very similar to the NBA and the collegiate basketball game. Um, a lot has to do with pace of play. Uh, people are not uh, willing to sit for three, three and a half hours to watch a football game anymore. So we're looking at finding ways to shorten the game if possible and make it more entertaining so people will come to the game. So you have to think of it as kind of a business, right? Whether even if at a college level, they're trying to generate revenue 
bring people to the game, bring people to TV sets to make money for the school. All right, so uh, pace of play is, is a big deal and we've done a lot of different things in that area. Um, and I can articulate in a, cu a couple areas that uh, are benefits to the fans because of uh, we shorten the game. But probably the two biggest rule changes uh, that uh, you'll see, um, it has to do with player safety. That's by far the number one rule change that you'll see and you'll continue to see and continue to see it as a, a, a point of emphasis every single year. So for the last five or six years now, um, player safety, let's use, just use the area of targeting. Most of you might know if you watch a football game, don't hit a, a defenseless player above the shoulders in the head and neck area with force. And it has to be an indicator. And, and the whole idea uh, and the studies, and I'm not the expert in this area uh, on CTE, but there's enough evidence to tell you that getting hit in the head multiple times is not good for your health. I mean, it's really clear. And if you think back, and there's nobody in this room, there's only a couple people in my age in this room, but if you think back to the 50s and the 60s, all right, the number one sports were horse racing, bowling, and boxing. I mean, they still bowl. You might see a little bit of boxing, you know, and there's some horse racing. Spectator sports, the three biggest. Things change. And why did boxing drop off the face of the earth? Too many deaths in the ring in the 50s. In the Big Ten, there was a death in the Big Ten boxing, and all of collegiate dropped that. So it's been going on a long time. If you think about when football started 150 years ago, in just a hundred years, just a little over 100 years ago, there were 16 deaths in 1906 because of football. They almost dropped football then, before it hardly started. So player safety continues to be a big, big deal. So that's our number one rule change every single year. Different types of changes like kickoffs, low blocks, high hits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those are the things that are going to get everyone's attention in football every single year. And the other rule change, and maybe the most significant rule change, Maybe not the most important, but one of the most significant rule changes was technology embedded into football when they started instant replay. And that's because of the pressure of football to get it right, to be accurate, to be accountable. And replay, because the human eye sees the play about um, 20 frames per second. When you see it at home in slow motion, you see it at two or three frames per second. So we're not, we don't have the capability to see, is his toe in, did he catch the ball, one eye at his foot, one eye at him catching the ball. We're not that good. We make five or six mistakes in a college game at the Big Ten level, every single game. 5.6 mistakes every game. NFL, about 3.8 mistakes every single game. And so do the players make mistakes and coaches and everybody else. But they brought technology into the game to help make it, I talked a little bit about being the keepers of the integrity, to be fair. So the teams get a fair shot at who the, who the right team should win the game. So technology is a big rule changer for us. How can we improve the game? And of course, changing the rules to protect those players, defenseless players, things that we don't want, that we want out of the game, we're gonna regulate it by rules and say, you know, it's gonna be a 15 yard penalty. It's gonna be 15 yards and you're out of the game. And you're gonna sit out next game. All right, pretty significant, big penalties if you sit out the next game when we only play 12 games, sometimes even 10 games at a college level per season. So one-tenth of your, your ability to perform, to maybe get to the next level or do the best you can, you know, you're going to have to sit out. And that, so the penalty is pretty high. We don't um, find the players, obviously, so we take playing time away. Big change rule-wise. Um, thank you, and um, I, we uh, talked um, on the phone a little bit about this, both uh, from the NBA's perspective and, and from a, a football officiating perspective of how important it is to, to uh, come up with communication strategies to convey these rules and to uh, make um, the process more transparent. And so uh, what are some of the things that uh, your organizations are doing to um, to explain the, these uh, changes and, and these roles to wider audiences, uh, whether it's to fans or to the media. Um, Lauren, if you could uh, start with, um, with the NBA. Sure, um, so for the NBA, you know, prior to this season, we relaunched our uh, NBA officials website, nba.com backslash official. 
you can go to that website every day, and every day at 9 a.m. Eastern, they post um, who's who will be officiating each game for that day. So if you want to see who's officiating, you know, the Bulls game tomorrow night, or if there's one tonight, you just go to that website and you can see. So that's an effort of transparency. Um, on the website, there's also the last two minute reports. You can find them in there. You can also find all of the replay um, reviews that have occurred. So anytime there was an instant replay trigger in a game, uh, you can click and view that the same video that the officials viewed on the court and see the, the outcome. Um, as well as there's a there's a video rule book on there, and the whole I idea was just to make it more uh, fan friendly. So if fans want to learn the rules, then they have the opportunity to do that. Um, another effort is in um, in regards to educating the broadcast teams. So just the impact that um, a broadcaster has on the perspective that you guys might have when you see a play, when they say, oh, there's you know, there's no way that was a flagrant foul, or that's not right, that skews your perspective on the play as well. Um, so just educating the broadcasters on the rules so that they can properly um, you know, say the right thing during their broadcast so that the public isn't skewed on you know, what's happening in officiating. And then there's also things that are happening in arena. So if you're in arena for a game, on the Jumbotron this year, if an official goes to review for a potential you know, flagrant one or hostile act, um, if you look at the Jumbotron, they list bullet points of, of what the officials are looking at. So um, you can look up there and have an idea of what they're going for, just as opposed to being in the arena and having no idea what's going on. So those are some things that are being done. As far as football is concerned, we're a little bit different uh, in this area than the NBA. Uh, we don't post the names of the officials, the men and women that are assigned to the games. Uh, we only give it to the media two hours before the game in the press box. A lot has to do with security reasons and um, confidentiality of who's actually working the game. Uh, we do post, you know, in some stadiums now, um, replays that you can see what the replay person is looking at uh, live in the stadium. And if we, th we think that's an advantage versus the people sit sitting at home. But uh, the rules and how we communicate those rules, that, that's a year-round process for us. Um, we have conference calls with media. Um, uh, right when the season ends, uh, for us, college championship game for, let's say, the Big Ten on December 1st. By December 3rd, that Monday, I'm in New York working on rules. You know, I'm sitting on the rules committee, on the competition committee. That's when it's starting immediately, even before the bowl season. Uh, so we have rules meetings. We have some tentative proposals for rule changes. Uh, we get together in early February. We take whatever we think is going to be approved, and we share them with all the officials, all the coaches. Uh, there's a, um, a, I think it's a 15-day window. It might be three weeks um, that we share with all the coaches and let the coaches vote on it, weigh in, let the fans weigh in, let the officials weigh in on those rules until early spring those rules become final. Once they become final, we le release it to the media and then we do media sessions um, with all of our teams uh, and officials on each campus. We go around and we pre present the rules, invite the local medias that are handling Bradley University that might be covering those games there uh, for, for as an example. Um, uh, and then what, what, what else do we do? We have media days. Every conference has what we call a media day. All the media people come in at one time and listen to the new rule changes. What I've also done, um, not necessarily it's unique, but I think it, it helps uh, gain some credibility for the officials, for the men and women that do our college football games, is I usually find our harshest critic in the media. And I go to that announcer, that ex-player, that PA guy, whoever it might be, and say, I want you to work the spring game at Butler University for our spring game or at Ohio State. And I put them in uniform, I train them, and I did this in the NFL with Matt Millen. Matt Millen and John Madden were a big critic of us, and I was working games, and they would criticize my work. I says, I want Millen, biggest, toughest guy in the NFL, five Super Bowls, I want that guy. I'm, and I found him, talked to him, I said, I'm putting you in uniform, I'm taking you to my clinic, I'm going to train you. I'm going to put your butt on the field with us, and you're going to find out how easy it is to work an NFL game. And I did it in New England with him. And, of course, I could tell you stories about it, but he didn't do very well, and he's our biggest supporter for officials right now. <laughs> so 
Every year, I will invite anybody from the media to come with me, go on the field, put the stripes on, and you try it. And that gained a lot of support from that in the media. So it's, it looks easy. My example in slow motion versus regular speed, you know, it's, it's reality. And if you think it looks pretty simple, then you should try it sometime. Go to your little brother or sister's game sometime in soccer or basketball. Who hit the ball out of bounds last? You make the call, and you'd be surprised how fast that happens if you actually have to make that call. So we can try to communicate that, so we do things with the media all the time. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the Big Ten Network in my office in Chicago, if I leave my office, adjacent to my office is a little studio. So if I have a critical call at Illinois uh, or Wisconsin or whatever the Big Ten school is, I walk into my office, maybe Monday, I want to get a message out to all the head coaches or maybe it's to all the media, whether it's Fox, ESPN, Big Ten Network, et cetera, whoever has access to our games, and I can do a broadcast right from my office. Uh, so we communicate live on a regular basis on a Monday morning or it could be any day during that week. So I use it a lot with the coaches to get the si a single message out to be consistent with the coaches, but with the media and the communications, it's critical to our success. We don't want to be, I mean, Lauren made a good comment. She wants to be transparent. So do we, and we do it just because of background checks and the focus on football and gambling and everything else. We may get into that, but we keep our officials away from everybody because mm -hmm. they want to know inside information. You were at practice. You saw this. Is this quarter? You had him last week. How's his arm? Is he injured, et cetera? And they aren't worried. We're not worried that our officials will be involved in, in game and in fixing games or gambling in games as much as giving information away. Mm -hmm. So we have to watch. We have to dummy down that communication to our best friends at lunch because they want to know, and I, you know, I don't know Ryan that well, but you know what? He, he's asked me a lot of questions. He may be gambling on the game, <laughs> legally in Vegas or whatever, and, th and that's what we're concerned about. So I said, mm -hmm. you're not the expert. Mm -hmm. You know, be careful who you communicate with as much as we want to over-communicate during the game. We were the first to put microphones on referees, tell the world what happened. Football is a complicated game. So there's a lot of things on communications, and I will hire, and I've done it, almost every other year at least, and we did it in the NFL, we hire media to come and teach our referees how to stand up, how to put the lapel uh, mic on and talk to the crowd, holding 76 offense, five-yard penalty, 10-yard penalty, fifth, whatever it might be, you know, first down. You know, and it sounds easy, and you get used to it because they're pretty good on TV now at the Big Ten level, NFL level, but it takes practice. So we go to the experts you know, in communications, media people to help us with that. And there is so much to unpack in what you just said. But first of all, to our sports communication students, um, you have been assigned homework and your reports are due on Tuesday at 1030 on uh, your experience of refereeing a game. So there you go. You did not think that was going to happen at the symposium. Um, <laughs> We're recruiting. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, two representatives from who have experience in the media industry, right, for in production and journalism. And so, um, what are some elements that resonate with um, with your professional experience in terms of this conversation? And um, what do you see as your uh, or media? Uh, professionals, uh, many of whom you teach now, right, in your current roles, uh, what do you see as their ethical and professional responsibilities in terms of some of the issues that our um, official um, guests uh, suggested? This is um, a, a real interesting perspective because I see it in three hats. Uh, when I was at Fox Sports, uh, Mike Pereira did a weekly chat with our, when we still had like a text website, we, he would do a weekly chat with um, any of the, our football fans. So he, every week for an hour, he would engage. So I agree that football, and, and basketball now with the, the Twitter account and the two minute report are way ahead of the curve in public engagement. Um, when it comes to what are our responsibilities, this is now getting into points two and three. Uh, Bill, you had mentioned like how the rules were disseminated and people voted upon it, um, like how much of a vote do the players have in creating the rules or things like that? Because in football, and this kind of points two and three bleed together, um, journalists are report on what they hear or the stories, and players often voice a lot of criticism. Um, 
I know my colleagues at LSU were a little bit miffed about a, a targeting call, and the people in Green Bay were miffed with Clay Matthews. So, and it's a lot of the players complain, but do they, how big a voice do they have in rules creation or voting on rules? Well, we have players sit on uh, advisory panels. So every team will funnel up their questions. Every conference, uh, oh, those teams will funnel up to a conference and there's representatives. So it's, there's a little bit of bureaucracy in the NCAA yeah. and, and hierarchy. Uh, but if you get the right people on the panels, not, not a room of, you know, 75 people like we have here today, but you get to a smaller number, you can get some things done. So players are representative. The coaches have a, big, a bigger say, yeah. but they are pretty close to the players. They don't like the targeting calls. They don't like the Clay Matthew roughing the passer. They did a bad job, in my opinion, and I love the NFL and I'm on NFL pension, but did a poor job <laughs> at communicating the new rules and point of emphasis. They worried about what's a catch, no catch. They worried about what's targeting. And oh, by the way, uh, yeah, Aaron Rodgers, that quarterback up north, uh, he got hurt, so we're gonna change, we're gonna inf enforce and be, make it a special emphasis on that. Uh, for roughing the pass. Well, they didn't tell anybody until the first game of the season and Clay Matthews got hit. And they go, oh, that's a point of emphasis. And they said, well, when did you tell us that? They didn't do a good job communicating that and being consistent with that rule. So they kind of dropped the ball. And it's, I criticize them and I love them um, because it's really hard. And it's easy to step back and say, we could have done this differently. You know, so um, players have a big say to answer your question. You know, and, and I think that because they play the game, um, but that ball is usually carried by a coach, by an athletic director. I sit, I'm the only referee, if you will, on, re on the rules committee and on the competition committee. So I have to represent all the refs too. So there's another group that feeds suggestions. We have fans feeding suggestions and we figure it out. That sounds like a good rule, Ryan, but you know, we can't enforce that. Like, like Lauren said, you have to be able to make a change. What, and, and if you make a rule change, even though a player might want it, what are the ramifications? What are the unintended consequences if you do this? And that's could many times a problem. So you gotta think through it. Ryan, how do you see the role of media producers in all this? Uh, so to me, it's, it's all about um, your upstream decisions, exactly as, as you said. Mm -hmm. What are the ramifications of the upstream decisions downstream, whether it be on players, whether it be on fans, um, whomever. And that's really what I think is important. If you make, if you choose to show um, a player gets really injured uh, during a play, if you choose to show that as a content producer, as a director, what impact is that going to have on the game? What impact is that going to have on uh, your network? What impact is that going to have on the people watching, right? So that those sort of upstream decisions, I think, really need to be unpacked so those ramifications are appropriately considered and anticipated on the back end. And uh, to build off of that, I think there's also an ethical responsibility to continue to educate yourself, right? And so I'm very encouraged to hear this conversation. Um, you know, to take this to video games, right? It, it has, uh, video games, the, the level of attention paid to video games has grown exponentially in the last couple of years. And there is a bit of a rift between people who look at traditional sport and esports. Right, and, and I think it's incumbent on media producers to continue to educate themselves, especially when it's an area where they might not be as comfortable or as informed. And so to follow up on that, what, are, what do you see as some ethical concerns about esports at the moment? And uh, other panelists can chime in on, on this as well uh, if you have uh, something to add, so. Sure, so um, there are almost too many to count at this point, to be honest. Uh, it's almost entirely unregulated at this point, as I mentioned. Um, the NCAA doesn't regulate it. There aren't player unions like there are in other professional sports. And I think uh, the previous panel touched on this, and it's a prime example, right? The, the shooting at the Madden competition in Florida. Um, 
these players might be playing games for 18 hours a day to get an advantage over their competition. As someone who loves video games and plays video games, I can tell you that's not healthy. That is not healthy. Um, but to be truly competitive in some of these domains, that's what you have to do. And so we shouldn't be surprised when these people are suffering from maybe mental illness or suffering from sort of some sort of physical uh, debilitation because of how they are structuring their lifestyle. And I think that comes in the form of no regulatory body, right? NCAA athletes can only practice for so long with, with being in compliance with NCAA rules. That is not the case for esports. Um, and, and so I think that to me is a really important thing and something that the esports industry is really going to have to come to terms with moving forward uh, because it's not, it's not a, it's not healthy. A lot of the South Korean players, right? South Korea is really a leader in esports. They have had all kinds of government sponsored initiatives to make that a, a national project. Uh, but there are very, very common stories about players cheating, right? Because they are, um, they feel so much pressure and there aren't a lot of, there isn't a lot of oversight or players attempting suicide after they lose a big match. Um, and that's likely because they're not getting the support that is built into a collegiate system. Um, and that, uh, you know, there was a Counter-Strike Go team who, who won a really big tournament and they basically admitted that they were all on stimulants, right? Not technically against the rules, but probably something that the esports e community as uh, in general wants to discourage, you know, PEDs, right? And so I think there, there are a lot of really, really potent uh, ethical challenges facing that industry right now. And, and like I said before, and stealing from your dean, it's the Wild West right now, which simultaneously makes it really exciting, but also, you know, we need to think about those upstream decisions and what they're going to, to do to, uh, to, the, to the sport, if we're willing to call it that, and the, the players, the game, et cetera. I, I think also, to piggyback, the, the league is also, or not league, but esports, I think is struggling um, in attending to gender equity and rampant homophobia. And so there are players who are being suspended and penalized and things like that. And so these things, as you become more bureaucratized, I think that the, this is not a bad thing, right? we want people who are representing our cities, our states, our university to adhere to a, a certain public standard, a decorum. And so this is something that has to be addressed as I think you use this term again, this wild west. Um, and I think secondly, I think for those who are interested in this topic, I think you all should read uh, Jay Coakley's uh, great journal article, What is Sport? because there is a lot of things that go into it. I mean, and esports is new. When you're looking at uh, what baseball had greenies and these stimulants years ago, like should you be allowed to do this substance versus that substance and what are you picking up at GNC? NPR had a piece about esports trainers. I didn't know about, there are specific keyboards that you use that are faster click times. This costs a lot of money to get this infrastructure, infrastructure built. I think um, y'all's AD here talked about that. It's not something you wave a magic wand tomorrow. I, I would imagine to our referees, to create a whole governing system is not something that you can do in about a month or something, right? Nope. <laughs> um, 
Steve, you mentioned uh, gender equity, and that's actually one of the areas you research in the uh, media industry. And Ryan, you've done some work on, on uh, issues of gender in esports. Uh, so, to, to the two of you, what are some patterns that you see in terms of um, uh, gender issues in the media industry? What are some changes or opportunities that are happening um, in, in the industry on that level? Um, what has your research found? You want to go first? Or sure. I'll go first. Okay. Um, so, as, as mentioned, I, I research video games and esports. So, those of you out there who play video games know uh, video games and women have a very, very contentious relationship. Uh, if you're talking about the games themselves, women are either underrepresented or they're rep represented in a highly sexualized way, right? There, there's heaps of research on that. Uh, within that, those of you who play know, uh, playing online games can be extremely unwelcoming to women. Um, women are often viewed as, uh, they're, well, first and foremost, they are subject to a large degree of harassment from the community. Uh, if, if you are, you know, oftentimes this is a faceless thing, you're, you're only identified by your voice. If you become identified as a woman, you're subject to harassment uh, or, um, you're discredited as a gamer, right? You're not, you're not a true gamer, so to speak, such that you are, you're there to kind of get attention from the boys, right? And so, so it's a very difficult space for, for women to kind of be a part of. And uh, I think that feeds into, that broad perspective feeds into the esports community as well. If you look at a lot of the big competitions, in esports, women are very rarely present, very rarely, despite the fact that they are welcome to be on these teams. They are, there are no rules excluding them from these teams. It was big news if some of you follow the Overwatch League, right, when the Overwatch League got its first female player. That was big news. Um, and it was big news because she was an anomaly, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, you know, you watch, um, a lot of the League of Legends matches, right, and uh, and things like that, and it's dominated by men. There are some female fighting game players who who are high profile, and uh, some other games. But Counter Strike has now started this thing, uh, or some of the the organizations that house teams have female Counter Strike teams, right, and uh, and they're very much treated by their organization despite the fact that they're making that distinction between gender, they're very much presented as equals to their male counterparts. And, uh, and so I think to me, that's a step in the right direction, right? That's a step in kind of creating a more welcoming environment that we're not just having these women on who are, you know, uh, really beautiful and stream and, you know, have to use innuendo to kind of garner an audience, but, but, allowing women the platform that the same men have, but, uh, and allowing them to, to present themselves how they see fit, whether they want to have a stream where maybe they are um, a little more playful uh, or a little more professional, right? And so to me, that's a step in the right direction, something that I've found recently in my research. Steve. I, I think that if we were to look from like 1960 to like now, significant progress has been made. But it appears as though, like in sports communication, journalism is what I look at, we've stagnated. And I think that one could also argue in some instances we're going backward. How many of y'all seen drone racing on TV, on ESPN? Cornhole, eSports. What do all three of these things have in common? They're all male-dominated sports. More sports are being created, and it's replicating a structure that sports are for men. I think that we need more women in a lot of uh, um, executive positions. How many of y'all in, live in the town where you, you've, your state has invested uh, hundreds of millions of dollars into a new arena. How many of those arenas 
are built for women's sports? How much tax dollars are we giving there, right? Um, when you look at, like, if you're a political journalist, how much of the money are going to businesses that are uh, female-owned or uh, racially or racial minority-owned? So you look at these structures, which I talked about at the beginning, and so when we talk diversity, it is not a political correct thing. You have more diverse people, you're allowed to look at issues from multiple perspectives. If you have only one perspective, that's what you're gonna get. And so we've made progress, and you know, I, I credit uh, ESPN and Fox uh, at the national level, uh, because they get really good marks from Richard Lapchick. But next time y'all listen to your sports talk radio, go see uh, how many women are on, that, on the local show? How many people are in the local newsrooms? How many racial minority journalists, not former athletes, are on those radio shows? And so you'll start to see, I live in the Cincinnati area now, FC Cincinnati's, I don't even think an MLS team, they get bandwidth on the radio. But University of Cincinnati, I think uh, they were renovating the gym. They put the women's basketball team in the high school gym or attempted to put the women's team in the high school gym. And so how many people would really say, oh, that's weird, or accept an answer at face value of, well, they have a smaller uh, fan base Therefore, uh, we won't go, or they don't need it. But LSU's men's basketball team a couple years ago was, was not stellar. They were not filling the uh, basketball arena. You know what was filling out the basketball arena? Women's basketball got more. Gymnastics sold out. And so we really need more people to talk about a wider range of things I think, to get at some of the issues that are being discussed at the panel. And we actually have somebody on this panel who um, has been very successful at promoting um, women's sport, and particularly, Lauren, you worked um, for the Chicago Sky, which is a WNBA team, and now uh, you're, a, um, uh, you're you know, moving forward in your career. And so what are some strategies you have seen in your career that um, you feel like have worked in terms of promoting women and promoting women's sport? Um, I think one of the biggest things that I noticed when I took over as media and communications manager for the Chicago Sky was, um, you know, when I started with the team, I was pitching news stories or I was hosting media days or hosting media availability um, and inviting, you know, people to come speak with the team. And it was a constant butting heads between could I get them to come to our practice and talk to our players when we were in season in the summer or were they going to send their entire <laughs> TV crew to go cover, you know, Chicago Bears training camp, which isn't, which is out of season for them. You know, so it was constantly butting heads of just, you know, I wanted to win over them. And um, what I ended up doing was just developing a new strategy where I figured out who was the head of the PR department for the Bears, the Bulls, the Blackhawks. Um, and I communicated with them as far as, okay, we're going to host our media day. I'm looking at, you know, May May 18th, do you guys got anything going that day? And just tried to plan around it because I just realized we weren't going to win, you know, some of those things. So that was something that was really successful for us, um, you know, because they wanted to cover us. At times their hands are just tied as far as how many, you know, crews they have to send out on a day and, you know, what their producers are telling them they want covered. So... Um, I found that to be successful, and then, uh, as you mentioned earlier, the thing that ended up in uh, Sports Illustrated ended up being uh, an Elena Deladon mean tweets campaign. Um, so there was some mean tweets. She, Elena Deladon played for the Sky, now she plays for the Washington Mystics. Um, she went off and had 45 points one one day in a game, and then all of a sudden, you know, people on Twitter, there was just tweets coming in as far as you know, get back in the kitchen, you should be cooking, why are you on the basketball court? You know, people were saying all these things. And so I had a team of interns and um, they started, you know, screenshotting the, the tweets that were interesting. And then the next morning at practice, we ended up showing her all the tweets and just filmed like her, her live reaction to, 
her reading the tweets off of you know my computer, and then uh, we sent that out, and it made you know Sports Center, CNN, um, the clip kind of really just picked up coverage, and then there was a Sports Illustrated article written on it. So just taking kind of how ignorant people are being, and you know giving females a opportunity to stand up for themselves, I, th I found that to be pretty successful as well. Um, and as far as where I am today, you know, I feel very fortunate to work for the NBA because they are very uh, pro-female. Um, there's already been G League games this season where there's been uh, on a crew of, you know, three referees, two out of three have been female. And um, it's not out of the question that there could be a three female crew coming up. And so to see three females officiating a men's basketball game, I think for a lot of you would be pretty new to see, but... Um, they're just really looking for, for quality officials at this point, and a lot has been done to, to form training systems where everybody has a chance to succeed. <laughs> Sorry, that's the airport. Um, but yeah, I feel like, you know, I have, I have just as good of a shot as anybody else to make it to the NBA as an official, and so for me, that's, that's really important. And then as far as what was talked about before with the eSports, I just wanted to mention the NBA 2K League started this past year. Um, the first draft happened, which a lot of people kind of poked fun at because Adam Silver, it was like in a theater just the same way the NBA draft is. And, you know, the first guy came across the stage and got a, a hat and a jersey from the team, from Adam Silver, just like you would in, in the real NBA draft. So um, that was kind of fun. And there wasn't a female drafted this year, but... Adam Silver ha has gone on the record, I believe, in saying that, you know, he hopes – some people are running to catch flights. He hopes that, um, you know, that there will be a female player soon. And, and the league has already expanded. I think it started with 17 teams, and this coming season it will have 21. Um, so that's something that's growing. And I also had the opportunity to go – they play their games in Long Island City, and I live in Queens, New York. Um, so they play them in a warehouse, and I had the opportunity to go and see kind of what that looked like, and I found that to be really intriguing as well. They have, you know, kind of a small stadium set up, and then the teams are facing each other, and there's, you know, a screen up top. There's a lot of trash talking that goes on between the players, which I found pretty shocking. Like, if they, if they score on them, then they kind of trash talk back and forth. And then each team has a coach, but the coach is only allowed to speak with the players during timeout periods. So there, there are certain rules that, um, that govern it, and it's kind of interesting just to see how they, how they put it together and uh, that the games are on you know, Twitch so fans can watch. I found this to be amazing, that fans are watching people play video games online. You know, that's never something I would consider watching, but apparently a lot of people, you know, want to see it. So it's, it's an interesting market and a thing that you guys should keep your eye on as far as growth and potential um, job openings if you're looking into something like that. Great. Thank you. Um, I think this is a great time to open uh, up the floor for questions. Oh, wow. Okay. Go ahead. The question was, how can changes in rules change gender inequality in sports? The perception, the perception um, about women in sports. I think this is an interesting thing, but I would defer to our rules people because, like, I, I've watched, like, the NBA, I've watched the WNBA, like, are, like, is a flagrant foul or, like, the level of contact judged the same, judged differently, like, I wouldn't presume to. Is that what you mean, or do you mean, is, are there any rules that there can be in place in order to ensure um, gender equality? Like if rules are changing and they're, they're making it more safe for mm -hmm. players to be able yeah. to play the game, mm -hmm. um, how would that change the perception for women to be able to play the sport mm -hmm. the same way? Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, okay. Well, Steve didn't want to take, make the call. He kind of. 
pass that <laughs> along. Um, you know, I, it's a re really good question. I was starting, I was going to answer your question that I don't think the rules need to be changed for gender equity uh, to make it available for, be built, to be, make it more diverse. I think the attitudes have to change, and, and I, I, I can address that. But if you wanted to make it, uh, change the rules so women can play, uh, that might be a difficult. It may take even longer. Uh, basketball, certainly. There are a lot of sports, golf. I mean, a lot of sports. When it comes to football, you'd have to dr dramatically change it. And I'm not saying touch football, but let me give you an example. It's, it's dangerous on the football field. It's a violent game. So I'm not trying to hide behind anything while we have pads. It's really safe. It's safer than it's ever been. All right, they have helmets. They, I mean, they have the best technology, best equipment. But I had a female official working last night, got injured got run over on the field. It could have been a guy. I have it, guys, the same thing happened. And at halftime, they called me, and I said, you know, be very cautious, be very safe. She's getting paid. Don't worry about it. And the trainers are great. It was down at the University of uh, Ohio. And, uh, and, she was and she did come back in the second half. But, but to change the rules would really change the game. So it, it, maybe that's a bigger question. Do we want another game that would be safe for everybody? And maybe we have so many injuries that maybe we, if we don't change the game, don't enforce these targeting rules, let's say, then we won't have a game in 25 years. I'll make that uh, prediction right now. If we don't take this serious, player safety, we won't have a game in 25 years, just like we didn't have boxing you know, in the mid-70s or in the 50s when they changed it. So it, it would have to change, but certainly women can play any sport. I have three daughters and a wife and I'm the minority at home. So I, I hear it from my daughters that all played college sports. And, um, but they played sports that they could get scholarships in that was available to them today. You know, so changing, I mean, football, you could be a kicker, you could, but you could be a runner. I mean, I have some officials that play in a women's football league, tackle football. Now it's all women, but they play tackle football. And now they've migrated over to the officiating side and they're pretty darn good because they have a good basis of the game. But I think our moderator made the best comment so far, in my opinion, tonight when she said, differences are our strength. She said that about an hour ago, and that is so true for, for officiating. Cast the net really big. Our game is changing. It's not a bunch of old white guys or young white guys playing football anymore. You know, it's 50, 60, 70 percent African American, and some, Someday it might be changing more for more women, skilled positions, or even if they're big enough to play, handle that. But there's a risk factor also. I had a woman that came in. She's the only head referee in college football. She works for me, and she came in as an umpire. I go, you're an umpire? You've been training as an umpire. Now, if you, many of you might not know where the umpire is in football, but it's just between the two linebackers, you know, on the defensive side, and it's like a grinder in there. The umpires are getting run over all the time. I said, okay, if you want to come to my staff, we're going to move you to head referee. We're going to put you on the offensive side, and the play will go away from you. I mean, I did that because I didn't want her injured in there. I don't want a little guy like myself in there at umpire either. I take an old ex-lineman in there. So you got to put them in the right spot to be successful. And I'm big at giving people opportunities. We have more women in our college conferences than any in the country. You know, and they've done pretty well. At Division One level, we have seven women working. They're working all the time, so we're trying to give them opportunities. Playing in the game, that's not my expertise probably. You know, I'm on the rules committee, but I don't think anybody is really pushing that to answer your question, but it's a great question. I just talk more about your question. And, oh, the, you know, I'm sorry, Lo. I just like, wanted to hop in and say one thing, you know, in, in response to your question. There was actually a recent uh, thing I saw on social media this morning, Neka Gumake is a WNBA player, and somebody asked her um, again about the question of whether or not the WNBA should lower their rims to nine foot versus ten foot. So that's an example of, you know, what would be a rule change, and that would make the two games totally separate. And the players do not want that at all. So if you go and you know listen to her response, it's basically, why do we have to do that? Now you're asking me. I've been playing the game my whole life at ten foot and you know at 10 feet and you know I'm, I'm a skilled player and now i'm gonna have to go relearn all my moves with the rim one foot lower so although it would bring dunking into play think about the impact it would have at the larger level 
even just as far as the trickle down effect to YMCA's and boys and girls starting to play together at a young age, you know, it affects all of that. And those are things that I think we want. We want kids to be outside and playing together and you want people to stay active and the amount of money that you would have to put in just so that this, you know, this difference could be put into place isn't worth it at all. You know, the women's basketball game is, is something special in its own. Uh, the players are fundamentally sound. And if, you know, if people come in and take a look at that, then most often they end up being fans. So, you know, that's the only thing that's, that's recently stood out for me. I, given more thought to your question, journalistic rules, journalists, I think we would all agree, help or really do shape public opinion of things. If instead of calling something, and the NCAA has made a lot of strides in this, right? If I said, who won the NCAA tournament in basketball last year, you would, uh, what would you all answer? Who? What question didn't you ask me? Notre Dame. So if we started implementing more rigid rules, like we have to coach, well, journalists have fired so many copy editors now, this is it's a whole nother discussion. We need to really coach up a lot of our sports journalists into one, stop saying like, so-and-so is the greatest female athlete. Right? I used to cover boxing. Manny Pacquiao is not that much bigger than me. And he couldn't whoop any heavyweight, like competent heavyweight fighter, because he was five, six, 150 pounds but they called him pound for pound the best player in the world, or best fighter in the world. I mean, uh, Laura mentioned Elena Deladon. I was working in Delaware when she was winning state championships <coughs> as a 14-year-old. She's one of the greatest basketball players in the world. But how come we don't say that? We say, LeBron, it's KD. You change the perception by changing, I think, a lot of the, the rules around people who shape perception because it's, but we don't have, we have guidelines, but not rules. Like, I won't filibuster much longer, but like how many of y'all expect to be a boss someday, an executive, a leader, a manager? Who makes rules? The boss. <laughs> y'all want to make changes. When you get into positions to be on a, a rules committee or you get in positions to help think about shaping policy, shape the policy, like make a difference. If you think, I think uh, one of our colleagues, Cheryl Cookie, uh, did a study about how much uh, women's sports are on Sports Center, and I think she found around 2%, okay? Now this has a lot to do with money and other things, but you know what? We're gonna put five. Okay, you just doubled, more than doubled it. So, I don't know if I answered the question, but. It's good. You've done a lot of research in this area, so <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, next question. Go ahead. Uh, the vice president, senior vice president of officiating made that decision. Uh, it wasn't the commissioner. Um, uh, it wasn't the senior uh, VP that reports that the senior VP reports to. Uh, he made it and it was based on performance. Um, I used to be the executive director for the NFL for the, you know, uh, Gene Upshaw handled the players. I handled the officials in that same era. And um, uh, we would be uh, very much opposed to something like that. They hired him, he, 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 uh, he was in the top half uh, last season. Um, there was pressure because of calls uh, on other games. Uh, he happened to miss a false start, which was wrong, um, but not critical at all. I mean, it, it, it's a blip on the radar screen. It's such a minor thing, so we, everyone thought it had to be something off the field. It absolutely was not off the field, but there was so much pressure on the NFL for performance and accountability, in my opinion, I think they use that situation to say, see, this coach is gonna get fired, this players get traded, you know, we're gonna, see, we're doing our job. 
and I don't think it was ri a right decision. If I was the boss, as Steve mentioned, um, I, I absolutely would not have done that. Now, at the end of the season, because usually one call should not get you fired. It took you 10,000 calls to get there mm -hmm. for Hugo Cruz to get there, you know, and, um, and overcame a lot of diversity issues and everything else for Hugo Cruz. Uh, he finally made it. He's one of the top, you know, 1% in the country, and one minor call caused him to get fired. So, um, but I think that, you know, I don't have, it's not, it wasn't my decision. I don't have all the facts. I'm giving you my opinion. Um, but I was disappointed with that. Um, and I, th I think you saw the NBA and the NFL Officials Association went together and made a public statement last week on it, along with, I think, the Soccer Association uh, officials. So um, there's a lot of public outcry, but you know what? We're little officials. We don't have a big vote, and, but you're, I'm giving you my opinion. I appreciate that, but it was, uh, it was duly noted by a lot of people, like what the heck is going on? Well, I know that Lauren doesn't hire, but she might have an opinion on that. So I'll let Lauren go first. I'm sorry, but I yes. actually can't. What goes into communicating to journalists, right, from the referee's perspective? And, and uh, Lauren, you were the media relations, so I'm sure you, you have uh, something to add here. What goes into communicating? Could you repeat that? Sorry, can you repeat the question? What, what goes into uh, from the officials to communicate to journalists who will be conveying opinions to the public? Um, so, so if there's a controversial call in a game, um, following the game, there, there's a request. There could be a request from a reporter. It's a pool reporter, so only one reporter would have the opportunity to speak with the crew chief from that night, and um, all of that goes goes through an approval process. Uh, by the NBA Director of Communications. So we aren't allowed to speak to media unless unless we get approval um, from our boss and from the communications department. So even just to speak on this panel, I had to go through a series of you know six people for approval. As far as football is concerned, we're very similar. You have to get approval in season for sure to go to any gambling establishment, to do any uh, media interviews, et cetera. Um, the, the media is off limits for the game officials. Um, uh, sometimes it's for uh, human interest stories about officiating, that's fine. Uh, we might made, make an exception to that. And I think Lauren's is probably an exception to it. They take a look at it. It's not controversial. We're not talking about last night's call, what happened, et cetera. As far as our officials, um, I've given all my head referees at, at, at Division One level, the authority, and I have the, the confidence uh, um, to respond to the media after a game if there's a controversial call. Okay, we call it a pool reporter. It's one person de designated. After every game, they can come in and they can talk to the person who made the uh, the officials that made the call. It's usually I have one spokesman, it's the head referee. So we in, we we encourage that. We allow it, if you will, uh, after a game. If we, I get calls every Monday, sometimes Sunday, after a college football game. Um, I will not make comments on judgment calls unless it had a huge impact on the game um, or significant, you know, if the national sports are, are talking about it and it deserves, and maybe once every few years I'll make a comment during the season. You know, a public statement, um, maybe a public statement that I reprimanded the officials because we made an error in judgment, we made an error in, in applying the rules, make that known to the media, um, or I answer a rules question anytime to the media. You know, here's the rule. You may not like the pass interference call that Ryan called, but here's the rule. He cut him off, he's an arm bar, it goes in this category, he was beat, his feet were beat, he was in chase mode, and this is why it's a foul. Okay, so I can quote the rule to, to them, um, but I'm not gonna necessarily make public, like the NBA does, they're a little more transparent, because I'd have too many, my full-time job would be commenting on judgment calls because every fan base is pretty strong when it comes to football. So 
we try to work with the media. We have, I have five people in my office that are in the communications. Three of them focus only on football, right, to, and to handle those requests that come in. And then I'll give them the rule, or I'll make the comment, the quote myself. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, we ran out of time, but there is good news. Those of you who still have questions, the panelists are here too, um, and you can talk to them um, about any questions you may have. I would like to invite you to join us for our afternoon um, and evening panels. The next panel is at 1.30, so take a quick break. And uh, please uh, help me thanking our panelists for joining us today. Thank you.